Keith. So Keith Linder is an IT professional. Previous employers include Dell Computers, Microsoft, Philips, AT&T, and currently F5 Inc. His hobbies are fishing, recreational sports, wine tasting, going to movies, and road trips. In 2012, Keith and Tina moved into a house in Bothell, Washington, a suburb of Seattle. The phenomena Keith and Tina witnessed while living in the Bothell house would change their lives forever. Whether you're a believer or non-believer in the paranormal, the story Keith is about to share with you, along with the massive evidence from researchers around the world, will leave you questioning your belief about the supernatural. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, all the way from Seattle, Mr. Keith Linder. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for uh, having me. It feels good to be here, to be back. Uh, what's the name? Once again, my name is uh, Keith Linder. I see some familiar faces, familiar names, names that I exchange emails uh, on a uh, continuing basis. Um, back. Uh, to talk about this case and to talk about uh, uh, in general. Uh, I'm going to turn my camera off only because I'm going to be sharing my screen. And I want to use up less than my uh, PowerPoint presentation. So uh, this is me manually turning off my camera, not the attachments that we're going to be surely talking about in a few seconds here. So uh, let me see if it'll allow me to share my screen. And then you should see uh, PowerPoint. Let me know if you can see that. Yeah, that's perfect, Keith. We can see it. OK, can everybody make out good what that is, or do I need to? That's you and Tina. Is that right? Yeah, that's me, uh, Tina, correct. Okay. Yeah, that's perfect. OK. So I'm going to start from the very beginning. Um, once again, Keith Linder. Uh, I am one of the survivors of the uh, Bothell House, what I call the Bothell Hell House. I'll give a brief introduction just to get people re-familiarized uh, with the case. Uh, me and Tina moved into this house. This is the dwelling unit, single unit, two-story unit. Uh, that Tina and I moved into May 1st of 2012. Um, some of the phenomena that we witnessed while living there um, fit the textbook of other Portuguese cases. Many do not. But one of the things I want to tell all listeners listening today is uh, there's a misconception about Portuguese activity in the sense of when me and Tina moved in, we begin to experience activity on day one. Um, there's a, uh, I, I believe, misinformation around other Portuguese cases that the conclusion is people who experience Portuguese cases are undergoing or experiencing some level of trauma, strife, dysfunction, turmoil in the home. Uh, the Bothell case, the Bothell Hell House, uh, in my opinion, should um, put that uh, belief to bed. Uh, me and Tina, having been together for two years already, I, after uh, having obtained uh, a significant raise and employment, um, I guess, if you will, a new position, uh, if you will, um, nothing turmoil, nothing stressful about moving into a new home with your girlfriend after you two have been together for two years. And we began experiencing activity on day one. I had just recently started at a new company and that was what led to acquiring uh, this house. So activity began on day one. Some of the activity this case is known for that you've heard are objects thrown. Of course, things started slowly, but surely began to, um, I guess, increase in intensity and increase in the level of frequency. Uh, objects did catch fire. 
uh, three Bibles in particular did catch fire. Uh, the first Bible went missing almost a year and a half and was returned on fire. Uh, waking up and discovering kitchen cabinet doors open, all kitchen cabinet doors open. This happened on numerous occasions, uh, not just one time. Objects missing, objects being found that neither Tina nor myself uh, owned, particularly kid toys. Uh, other people's mail began to appear inexplicably uh, in a location of the kitchen, the kitchen drawer. And by other people's mail, I mean right address, not Keith and Tina's mail, different names are on the mail. But the posted step, the time step, is several years before we even arrived. Some of the mail that arrived or was found uh, in drawers that were already occupied by our belongings were letters and dates uh, that preceded even me and Tina as a couple. So you're looking at 2006, 2007 letters and envelopes where Keith and Tina were not even a couple then. Me and Tina met April 15th, 2010. So these letters and whatnot predate even us, but they're being found in the kitchen, just one location in the home. And that and itself was weird. That was spring, summer of 2012. So once again, who is Keith and Tina? Once again, I'm an IT professional. Tina at the time, or still is, was in marketing and sales. We had successfully been together over two years and we lived in different places. Us moving into the Bothell home was the first time we were living under one roof. May 2008, 2016 was when I officially moved out of the Bothell house. Um, this information is on my YouTube channel for all to hear and listen. There is a video, I believe it's an hour and a half long, where I, uh, on the day that I was moving, I set up listening devices throughout the house primarily the kitchen, and I just left them running. And I had a video camera running, and these audio devices and video recording devices picked up unexplained voices the day the movers were moving me out. Majority of these voices you can hear were when the house was empty. The movers have now taken my items, loaded it onto the truck, and are moving it to my second place of residence. Um, the audio recordings still running did capture the voices primarily saying the word Keith, my name, over and over repeatedly throughout the moving process, throughout the me signing the papers that the movers have indeed taken my property and are about to move it elsewhere, and me closing up the home to go meet the movers at my second place of residence. Uh, I've shared this audio and video with several members of the paranormal community as a means of, you know, bringing more understanding to poltergeist phenomena, as well as more understanding about my case. One of the questions that I'm always asked uh, is, did I experience activity after I moved? And the answer is a resounding yes. Uh, in keeping with the theme of experiencing activity the first day I moved into the Bothell house, I did experience activity the first day or morning living in my place of residence, May 9th, 2016. And that is the well-known phenomena, but yet to be explained in other Portuguese cases, including my own, the appearance of strange water puddles. Uh, I won't go into detail about that episode, except to say I documented it in several of my books and the video of the water puddle phenomena 
uh, is on my YouTube channel. Uh, the video itself is not a reenactment. So when you see the video, it's of the actual event. Uh, but the answer is yes. Some of the activity that I'm still experiencing is the appearance of objects, um, mainly my own, but they are being removed around the house to different portions uh, of the home. Uh, the disappearing of objects, uh, the disappearing of silverware. Uh, I did experience an episode where my wine glass exploded. Now, this is very important. The wine glass exploded in my place of residence and exploded in a public restaurant. Okay. This was witnessed by the person I was with. Uh, I was on a date. Uh, truth be told, I'm no longer with Tina, but I was with another female companion. And she, along with myself, along with the wait staff, witnessed the exploding of the wine glass. Going back to the uh, earlier portion of this meeting where we were talking about how the Bothell case, myself and others are living witnesses and how the paranormal community has a whole, as a whole, has not taken advantage of interviewing witnesses myself and the people around me who have also witnessed the phenomena. We always hear about skeptics going online and making the case of, well, they want to debunk old cases, but can you really, is it really fair <laughs> to debunk an old case when the witnesses have passed on, they've moved on, we're looking at cases 50, 60, 80, 100 years old, but the conclusion is they can debunk it. Well, I'm here live and well, thank God, and all my witnesses are alive and well. And these are third party individuals who really have no brush with the paranormal, who really have no reason to interject themselves, if you will, except to say, yeah, I was there when this happened. I saw the wine glass explode. I can't explain it, but I was, was there. Other examples of the phenomena or activity that I'm still experiencing uh, is spontaneous fires. This is very important. Uh, spontaneous fire, objects catching fire. In my third place of residence, this was 2020, where a object caught fire in my bedroom. Interesting enough, the object caught, that caught fire in my bedroom coincided at the same time. By same time, I mean the very second I uploaded a video onto my YouTube channel that dealt with pyro poltergeist. And by that, I mean I was uploading new video reenactment footage of the spontaneous fires that took place in the Bothell home. Within seconds, the exact same second that I uploaded that video, those who are familiar with uploading videos to YouTube know the process. The second I did that, my alarm started ringing from my master bedroom, and there was a fire. That is not coincidence. Other activities include um, the infamous, and this never subsided, is the poking and prodding while sleeping, uh, the sheet tugging, the pulling down of bed sheets, uh, the mattress indentations while sleeping, or just by laying in bed of uh, feeling like an invisible animal or pet, mainly the size of a small dog, large cat, jumping into bed, uh, shaking of the headboard, tugging at the feet, uh, gnawing gnawing at the feet, uh, particularly the, the ankles and extremity area, meaning the toenails. Uh, these things have not subsided. They are as recent as last night or last week. Uh, night terrors, um, there's a thin line I feel between what is considered a night terror and a nightmare. Uh, both are under the umbrella of uh, having a bad dream. Um, my night terrors involve waking up with extreme anxiety, extreme shaking, uh, an extreme feeling of being flustered, 
Uh, but most importantly, while sleep, and this is important, while sleep, experience was, you know, waking up, you know, crying and in immense tears, immense panic. It's like running from something that you don't know what you're running from, but you can't escape it. Every room you run into leads you to the thing that you're running from. That's what I would experience or call a night terror. Another example of what I would call a nightmare is does previous experiences as a child, as an adult, and these are not, you know, traumatic experiences. These are just things that you go back in your head and you remember like an example, first day of school or first day at the playground or, or movie or something. And whatever is, you know, for lack of a better word, uh, attached to me, takes a hold of these dreams, these memories and turn them up on their head. So it takes a good experience, but it adds a nightmarish element to it. It's like watching a movie. It, a character that was not present in real life has stepped into the memory and is turning everything upside down. Okay, it's turning that good memory into a bad memory. Other nightmares involve me mentally uh, transporting to places, uh, horrific places throughout the world past and present, uh, some look like future. Uh, and then just being the observer, observing traumatic events that other people experience. Uh, those are nightmares. In between that uh, is something um, some of you might find interesting, is the succubus visits. Uh, that never happened in the Bothell house. Um, that spiked within weeks and days and months after moving out of the Bothell house. And truth be known, I put that information in book two, book three, as well as audio that I was able to capture uh, in book two. Uh, so there's that. But the I would say the baseline of it all, the one that never goes away, that I was experiencing even before I moved out of the Bothell house is the poking and prodding while sleeping, the mattress indentations, and the shadowy figures. Now, I want to go back and say something and, and just get it on the record for those who are not in this case. There was a family that lived in the Bothell house four to five years before Keith and Tina who experienced similar activity. I was able to capture or talk and communicate with the family, meaning the wife, Rhonda. Uh, Rhonda is no longer with us. She successfully committed suicide September of 2006. But those who read any of my books know, because I put Rhonda in the books, she said or described the activity that they experienced. And when I caught up to Rhonda, which was about August of 2014, Rhonda told me her son, this is her son, this is 2014, uh, this is about five or six years after they moved out of the Bothell house, still saw or was still seeing shadowy figures out the corner of his eye in Yakima, Washington, which is about five miles east of Seattle. Her son was still seeing shadowy figures while Keith and Tina and myself were experiencing everything I just told you and more. Once again, destroying in, my, destroying, in my opinion, the belief that poltergeist activity is somehow related to telekinesis or RSPK in, in, in the event of there's some sort of side going on, some sort of side network going on, going on that produces this phenomenon with the individual or the individual is a troubled individual. Here you have documented a family who's moved out of the Bothell house and you have a couple, me and Tina, living in the Bothell house, experiencing activity and Rhonda and her family were experiencing similar activity uh, 2008, 2009 uh, that I was able to document. Rhonda did try to commit suicide three times in the Bothell house. 
if you read my second book, Attachments, Portuguese of Washington State, you see or have the access to the PDF reports, not completed by Rhonda, but completed and reported by first responders, meaning police and sheriff department and uh, psychological departments of the state that responded to the distress call at the Bothell House. And this is their professional opinion of what they found when they arrived. Once again, the paranormal community as a whole, the skeptic community as a whole, has not confronted these evidence, has not confronted these or responded to this information. that's readily available and it is debunked from my opinion where you have professionals who have no tie to the paranormal but when you read their notes of what they saw upon arriving on the scene uh do support the claims that myself tina and rhonda were making rhonda never said that she had a house full of poltergeists rhonda only said that there were strange things happening in the house that she and her family could not explain. This was 2008, 2009. It was upon reaching me in 2014 that the puzzles slowly began coming together. One of the updates I wanted to let everyone know uh, on this call, once again, it's on my YouTube channel and in my two books is we determined or was able to determine the makeup of the black oil. And it was determined that to be bone black. Uh, bone black is not a material that you can readily or easily purchase. It is does not come in large quantities uh, anywhere. You can uh, go to your local paint store, I've tried after the fact, and requested a gallon of bone black. Your local paint store would not even know what you were talking about. Bone black in its truest form is incinerated buffalo and bison bone. Okay, but that's only half the riddle. I was able to, by purchasing uh, digital uh, microscopes, put to the material, put to the door, put to the wall, put to the bone black. The microscopes I purchased magnified the image 1,000 to 1,500 times magnification and was able to pull up the material bone black as it appears under a microscope magnified 1,000 times and discover that the material is also in the, what you would say, the portion of the wall or door that to the naked eye has no paint on it. So if you see in this image here, I have the digital microscope focus on the section of the door that is just all white, okay? A person walking into a room, meaning an investigator walking into a room will see, oh, I see 666. Oh, I see upside down, man. Oh, I see upside down cross. I see this black oil. Okay, that's only half of the puzzle. Okay, food for thought for you researchers who are researching or, 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 or research. If you ever find yourself in a situation where you're in a home and you see substance unexplained, wall writings, things of that nature, um, this took me four years to discover, but you having seen this could do this right away. I would recommend not only testing the visible surface, meaning the surface that has the unexplained or explained material applied, but also test the surface that this looks normal because the microscopes that I use showed that the black oil that we see with the neck and I talk about the macro level began at the micro level, meaning the black oil began as these little dots that are invisible to the naked eye because they're too small. And as these dots start to coagulate, the dots grew into tentacles, grew into wire, grew into string. 
and began to form bigger dots. And these bigger dots formed bigger dots, bigger dots to finally, it became onto the macro level to where it became visible to the naked eye. Okay, this would totally be missed by your average researcher in the sense of it brings true the proverb, there's more than meets the eye, especially with Portuguese, because I found this out in 2017 to 2018. Luckily, before moving out of the Bothell house, I took elements, meaning the wall and portions of the door with me because I knew it might be valuable to a researcher later on. And the idea hit me. I wonder what that door looks like under a microscope. It's always It always bugged me in the back of my mind that there has to be more here. What I've been able to con conclude is the black wall that you see in the Bothell House, primarily my office, that element began at the micro level and expanded to where it became visible. As it coagulated, it's the coagulation of the material that formed what you and I see, the 666, the upside down man the upside down cross and, but it did not appear, it was not applied like you and I would apply paint. It came through the constructs of the door, of the wall, of the foundation, which in my opinion explains or sheds a lot of light on the capability of poltergeist phenomena. Also reinforces my belief that we're dealing with something as a third party entity, something supernatural, because this cannot be reduplicated. Any of us can go get a spray can, uh, a can of paint and write or paint on a wall. None of us can get a spray can or spray paint and start it from the microscopic level and work our way up, if, if that makes sense. Uh, but the question worth asking is location. This was my office. Why would a spirit use bone black when, as you can see from the picture, it has a multiple, multiple um, of things it can use in my office because it's my office. It, I have pens, I have markers, I have Sharpies, I have dry eraser, I have uh, other pens, I have all these things that you could use to mark on Keith's wall, why bone black? Why did the entity here or entities choose or chose to use bone black? And going back to what bone black is, bone black is incinerated buffalo or bison bone, okay? Um, to understand why bone black was used versus any other liquid substance in my office that was equally present, we have to go back and understand and relook at American history. Um, in the early to mid 1800s in America, we saw the mass extermination of the American North American Buffalo. Thousands upon thousands to hundreds of thousands to millions of buffalo was slaughtered for obvious reasons, leather and skin. This led to, wasn't expected, but led to an enormous amount of buffalo carcass that littered the North American prairie. This was the, at the time viewed useless, the American buffalo the bones itself, but it littered. You would go by, it would be mountains and mold hills of buffalo carcass littered on the North American landscape. Till finally it was discovered that the bones, once incinerated, if incinerated, could be used as a form of black paint. And how was that discovery made? It was discovered because bone black been used by Native Americans and other cultures going back centuries is an organic basic form of 
black paint. Also, bone black itself is a perfect filtration system in the sense of you're just basically dealing with powdered charcoal, phosphorus. In the 16th century, North America contained 25 to 30 million buffalo. Bison were hunted to extension up until the 19th century. Fewer than 100 remained, okay? Now, I want you to understand, this is the mid-1800s in the middle America. In the Pacific Northwest America, where Keith Linder lives and still lives, something else is going on. There are no buffalo, natural buffalo, roaming the Pacific Northwest. It's too mountainy. However, there are trees. And the Pacific Northwest, during that same time period, saw the mass extinction and chopping down of trees to make way for the new world. Okay, you talk about massive, 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 massive chopping down of trees, of resources. This angered the Native Americans who lived in that area, who depended on the trees, who the trees depended on the rivers that provide the salmon population. Bothell, Washington, where the house is located, was one of those areas that saw the mass chopping down of trees, once again, simply put, to make way for the new world. You got an old world going out, a new world coming in. There's going to be friction. However, this picture right here is taken from the Bothell Historical Archives. You see Bothell, Washington, the, mo the moving of trees, logs, if you will. And what do you see pulling those trees? You see cows, you see bone black, which is in itself bone black. So this is physically putting something on location as to, okay, the mass chopping down of trees and what is hauling those trees? What is pulling those trees down from the hillside to the rivers so they could be made into logs, paper, and mill? This is an archive picture showing very that. And that's for this slide here, I sort of view as the bone black in my office, the location of the Bothell House, Bothell, Washington, Pacific Northwest, and the mass chopping down of trees is the same metaphor for the near mass extinction of the American love. There was once a point in time where both were in peril. That meaning there would have to be laws passed to stop the mass chopping down of trees, and there would have to be laws passed to chop down the mass extermination of buffalo. Both regions in American history brought about enormous friction between Native Americans and the New World. Okay. And the last update I want to just share, and then we can open up for questions, is after I moved out of the Bothell house and in my second place of residence, um, an idea hit me sort of like the digital microscope. Uh, can I capture the heartbeats or what sounded like heartbeats coming from my bed, my mattress while sleeping. Keep in mind, um, when I go to bed, even now, sometimes, not all the time, even now, I can put, when I put my ear to pillow, I can hear what sounds like a heartbeat coming from my pillow or the mattress. That's normally association or in a sync with the mattress indentations. It's also normally in sync with the poking and prodding while sleeping. These indentations make their way to me, up to me, on me, over me. And I begin hearing those heartbeats or what sounds like heartbeats coming from my pillowcase. But that's my naked ear. How can I capture that? What I was able to do is purchase highly expensive and they're expensive. There's no way getting around that. But I think these are very valuable and are a good tool for a paranormal researcher to have in their repertoire is 
digital stethoscopes. I don't mean any stethoscope. These stethoscopes here are, can magnify sound 100 to 1,000 times, okay? I was able to, by using both digital stethoscopes, who come with a phone app for iPad or Android, for I mean, uh, Apple or Droid, uh, can back, back up the data onto the cloud. Um, you can place the devices at a location and don't have to physically stay at the location. So you could take yourself out of the environment, which I did a few times. But using both of these digital stethoscopes, I was able to capture what I was hearing with my naked ear and save it and upload it to the cloud. The links to these are in my second book or available upon request by email. And um, the devices used were of the medical community, not paranormal community, which makes them more scientific in a sense of these are compliant, HIPAA compliant, other agency compliant. And when I put the audio, because you got to be objective, when I gave this audio to members of the medical community, the cardiovascular community, once again, individuals who have no stake in the paranormal or are scientists by occupation and definition, they were able to rule out what they view as not a heartbeat and be able to rule in what was. And they tell me, I never tell them where I got the audio from until after they tell me what do they what do they hear? Is it in a rhythmic heartbeat? And they tell me. And I always go to more than one source, more than one profession. It's the medical profession, but more than one source. No one knows the other. And their assessment has always been, if not equal near the same. This is a heartbeat. It is not human. And they tell me why. And then they say they cannot determine what it is, but it is, appears to be the heartbeat of a small animal. And that's their quote. And for that, I will open up for questions. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Caroline, are you free? I am, yeah. Thank you so much, Keith. That was an amazing update. Um, so interesting that it's um, still occurring. So let's skip to the beginning of what I can see on my list, Keith. It says, from Christian Lander, in regards to the apporting mail and items appearing in the drawers, has any form of residence been in contact that you've been able to reunite with the mail? Uh, good question. I, attempt, I attempted to uh, find these people whose letters were coming to me. Um, when, while living in the Bothell house, I would ask the landlord. Um, he would not divulge their new location or information. Uh, that's against the law. Um, so all I could do was give him the mail. I did try to find them or try to locate them on Facebook and on the internet. And that's how I found Rhonda. How I found Rhonda is her mail came to the home or was one of the mm -hmm. letters. And I, re I ran into a dead end with the homeowner, but I went on Facebook and was able to find her and contact her using that method. Thank you. Um, Christian's questions all seem to have come out together. So I'll read all of his and then we can move on to everybody else's then. Um, with yourself and Tina now parted, the activities continue to follow yourself. Um, has it still um, been affecting Tina in any way? Uh, Tina and I kept in communication the first few years after moving out of the Bothell home. She moved out 2015. I moved out 2016. And one of the questions I asked her, were you still experiencing anything? To her knowledge, she was not. Um, it's interesting, while living in the Bothell home, me and Tina experienced our own areas of activity. There were times where she were attacked and there were times that I were attacked and there were times we were attacked together. Um, I could say, and I feel good by saying this is, 
um, probably after summer of 2014 or fall of 2014, I became the only one being attacked, okay? They really pivoted from attacking us both to only attacking me. Also, full disclosure, Tina never saw the apparition. She never saw the gray lady or the white lady. I did. The, the apparitions that I saw went out of their way to make me see them. Um, I'm glad she's not having any activity um, now, Tina. And like I said, she told me she has it. But Tina was always very distant, more so than me, which I, you know, I will admit it probably explains why I still have activity to a degree. Um, spirits will engage you if they find that you take an interest in them. And by interest, I mean bringing in equipment, gadgets, cameras. Uh, I was more proactive than Tina to try to find a root cause. I was more proactive in trying to um, find a solution, if you will. And uh, so, so there's that. And I stayed in the house longer uh, than she did. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Um, we'll go back to Christian's questions in a minute. So Stu Neville says, hi, Keith. I remember you telling all of us on the 14 times board for Tina forums about your experiences. Um, please don't think we were being dismissive with all the questions. It's just rare we get such detailed and rational testimony. What first inspired you to share? Uh, great question. Um, being in the IT space and profession that I'm in, you know, we live by the uh, code of information sharing. I'm an IT project manager, and that's pretty much how we do it. We, we share information. We create technology that makes information shared easier quote unquote, the Zoom meeting we're on right now. When I started witnessing this phenomena happening around me and Tina are in the house, I didn't, I didn't understand, I still don't understand it. What I did was rely on what I know. This phenomena seems like it needs to be captured and is important. Not so much to me, but there's gotta be a community out there in the world that is just gonna lose their mind over this stuff. I mean, I'm being honest, that's, that's where my head was at. And I can do being on ground zero, use my technology, my ability to you know take meticulous notes and record keeping, compile this stuff because nobody's gonna believe this stuff if you can't show them nothing. you know. And I've been able to show people in multiple formats. You want audio, I got audio. You want video, I got uh, uh, video. You want witnesses? I got witnesses. You want testimony from third party, inside, outside? I got all that. And I just want to make it available to people. And then they take it and carry it to wherever they want to carry it because it's not my profession. It's not my quote unquote hobby or interest. It sort of is now because I got thrown into it, but it wasn't before. So, and in reading other past Portuguese cases, one of the things I would always read that sort of made me mad and feel sorry for the Portuguese experiencer or survivor was the person was like, well, you ain't got no evidence, or it's all anecdotal, or you know, why you didn't write it down or take notes or whatever. And they would always debunk them and dismiss them. And I'm um, and I'm, I'm fighting, I don't know how successful I am. I'm trying to show, you know, me and Tina had no brush with the paranormal. We're not paranormal teams when this happened. We were living our lives comfortably, happily. We fell into this or this fell onto us. So we, we, we really had no stakes here. We, we, we're the objective experiencer, if you will. But I know objects can't fly and levitate on their own. So let me document that and get it to people who may have more knowledge than me and let them run with it. So I, I view myself as just the record keeper. And I like answering questions, you know. So that's, I view my role. Thank you. Um, Darren Hudson, can you unmute yourself, please? Um, you can explain this little situation that you witnessed to Keith. Yeah, hi, Caroline. Hi, Keith. Um, yeah, you mentioned about the exploding wine glass. Um, I was at uh, a one-man show that Michael Fentine did. Um, in fact, I saw him twice, once in 1988 and once in 1989 in London, two different venues. The one in 1988 was at a small theatre in West London and 
um, everybody knows about Michael Benty, knows about his life as a, uh, a paranormal enthusiast and his background, etc. And um, it was a fascinating talk and show about his life and his experiences. And um, at the end of the show, he said to the audience, which was only quite a small audience, uh, maybe a couple of hundred people, he said, if anyone wants to um, have a chat with me, you know, in the reception bar area at the end of the show, please do. So people were milling around after the show. There was probably about 25 people around Michael Benteen and he was talking about further experiences. And um, he was holding a wine glass and he was actually talking about things that he's experienced in his life that were completely evil. Uh, and the three examples he gave were um, he was present when Belsen uh, concentration camp was liberated at the end of the Second World War. He was in RAF intelligence and he had occasion to be there. And he said that um, he, he just saw and witnessed and felt everything around that area was completely evil. Um, after that, he talked about um, being in the same company at some point. He didn't elaborate as Myra Hindley, the Moors murderer. And he talked about people who have um, no um, aura around them, which is, a, a, in his opinion, was um, a, a clue that there's some sort of evil in their lives or they're involved in evil. We mentioned Myra Hindley, and he also mentioned Jerry Adams in the same paragraph. And as he did that, he was literally holding this wine glass. It was as if someone had shot it with an air rifle pellet. It literally exploded in his hand uh, made us all jump, made him jump, uh, and he kind of rolled his eyes and said, this this has happened to me before, it's not the first time it's happened, um, usually when I'm talking about this specific subject, and it was quite um, unnerving. Uh, it clearly wasn't staged, uh, and it stayed with me ever since, and when Keith mentioned about uh, the exploding wine glass uh, and all the um, negative aspects that have happened with him and his experience in the Bothell House and outside the Bothell House, it uh, sprang to mind. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because you, you just jogged my memory of another exploding wine glass incident that didn't involve me. What my best friend and his girlfriend were having a conversation at his house and she was asking about the Bothell house and, and whatnot. And she got to the subject of Tina. Uh, me and Tina had broken up already. And she was started to talk negatively about Tina. Now we're both sipping wine, okay? And this came very abrupt. Um, and she made a negative comment about Tina. And she had known Tina a while. Uh, I don't know if she wanted me to agree with her or, or something, but she said something very negative about Tina. And her wine glass exploded in her face. And I had not yet experienced the other wine incidents I told you about. I had recently moved out of the house, but I had not had my own wine glass explosion yet. When that glass exploded in her face, the look on her face when it... I, I, I mean, as soon as she said the word Tina, da 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 da, boom. It was it was very insane, very abrupt. You could not walk away and think, no, nah, because she was like startled and shook. And I and I could tell she knew by what she said was the reason why that glass exploded. Because that killed the conversation right then and there. Now, me having lived in a bottle house, you know, are oh, you okay? Are you all right? I'm trying to clean up the wine off her and they glass she was wearing glasses because the glass didn't get on her eyes, but um, she was very taken aback by that. And I, I, and I, and I would say she probably was 90% a believer, but became 100% believer once that glass exploded in her, in her face. And I had no answer for it because I, I, I had never seen that happen yet. And it threw me for a loop. I was like, whoa, okay, all right, next subject. But yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, I can relate to that. Um, same feeling with me. Um, and I've never seen it happen since. Um, and we've all broken wine glasses and glasses in our time. And, you know, if, they're, if they've been in the dishwasher a bit too long and that's the end of their life, they might just snap. But, um, yeah. yeah, this thing actually exploded. There's no doubt about it. And uh, it's interesting that it's all surrounding the same sort of um, subject of negativity. Yeah. Thank you for that. What a great experience to have witnessed firsthand, particularly. 
Thank you, Darren. Um, moving down, Liz Barkley, what does Keith think are the reasons for the lack of the investigation of his case? Does he think that Ghost Hunters show had something to do with it? Great talk, by the way. Uh, I think there's several reasons. Ghost, the Ghost Hunt, Ghost Adventures being one. Um, but the serious paranormal community don't even, I mean, they don't consider ghost hunting shows real. So why would they disavow us based on what Ghost Adventures did not find? Um, the, the paranormal psychologists, the things that I do talk to are not surprised Ghost Adventures left empty handed. Um, but I'm talking about the bona fide paranormal communities and, and, and groups. And why do I feel they, um, there's several reasons. I, I, I'll try to name off a, a few of them. Number one, um, and this is not their fault. Uh, this case, there's just so much information. There's so much there, there. I mean, there's so much. And you find yourself inundated or not yet prepared to, to do. I mean, what do we, what do we do with this? What do we do with this stuff? Um, Keith, we seem to have lost you. you. You'd be, you know, analyzed. Keith, we've lost you. The other You're... one is a geography. Um, can you hear me now? Um, we lost a whole of that last little bit of that sentence. Um, I don't know if you want to turn your broadband width down by turning your camera off again, okay. do you? I'll okay. do that again. Yeah, just say the last bit again, please, if you could. Sure, yeah, I, I would just say some just are just inundated because there's just so much material from the Bothell House to where it mm. caught a lot of uh, organizations unaware and unprepared. Um, and the other element, I believe, is geography. Um, people are half a world away. Uh, many could not trek or make the journey to Bothell, Washington. Um, and then also the, the one that I, I, I believe is probably the most true is people have a built-in belief what the paranormal is, meaning poltergeist activity, maybe their own theory, maybe they subscribe to another person's theory and they, they want to shed light on that theory not take away from it and it's not my fault but the evidence obtained by the from the Bothell house um destroys a lot of existing theories out there or brings about the question of what we believe poltergeist to be and it's not me it's the evidence we should go by what the evidence says and if a theory has to be renewed or reevaluated that's a good thing, you know. That means we're getting closer. Um, the only reason why much evidence from the Bothell House is because Keith stayed in the Bothell House for years. Most people would leave at the first sign of activity, and when they leave, you know, you you don't get evidence that way. It's you know, it's probably good they leave, but from a scientific point of view, you want somebody to stay there as long as they can and give you the information while they can. And another one, like I said, I think is the bias. I also think there's a racial component uh, to it. Uh, most of the Portuguese survivors that I study, uh, they're a very, uh, and rightfully so, they don't want anything to do with the evidence or the phenomena. They just want it to stop. And we did too. We wanted the phenomena to stop. Um, but the people in the past who've experienced Portuguese activity, uh, they were told what the activity was. Oh, it's you, it's it's your brain, it's your you know turmoil in your home, or you're depressed, or you're this, you're that. They, they're, they're being diagnosed. Um, and me and Tina, you can't die, it's hard to diagnose us. I mean, good job, good employment, good home. Nobody can find, you know, Steve Mara said it best. There was no level of dysfunction observed in the home by him and other teams having lived there three, four, five weeks to where the only thing you can come back with as a culprit is 
We must be looking at a third party entity. We must be looking at a sentient being or beings that are present in the home whose job is to create havoc. And I think the current paranormal community as a whole tries to shy away from the third party presence because in the face of their peers, you know, the scientific community as a whole, they fear the being mocked at, oh, there you go with that, you know, demon stuff, that ghost stuff, you know. And so they try to hush, hush, hush that. And the Bothel House over here is trying to slowly beat that wall down, like, no, 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 it's it's this, not that. And in the evidence, they, they're telling you who they are, what they are. These are intelligent. I mean, listen to the EVPs and the conversations being had by one explained voice to another and the back and forth. I don't think the paranormal cue has ever captured, and I, and I don't have no knowledge or access to all the EVPs that were captured in the world, but uh, I feel comfortable in saying, I don't think the paranormal community has any unexplained EVP out there, unexplained voice out there, where you have a male voice on audio, unexplained, telling another male voice to go steal something in the home, to go take a camera, you know, verbally, enunciates it well, articulates it well. And what has been gone missing in the Bothel house? Cameras. But now we have audio where one tells one to tell, to go do that. Go steal one, you know, go do this, go do that. We have a voice where you hear an audio and video well, you hear a loud bang, boom, crazy loud bang. And on the audio, you hear a male voice say, you threw that too hard. <laughs> okay? That's on audio and video. And the paranormal community as a whole, they, 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 they just sit on their hands like, oh, oh, oh. And when I call it, hey, do you hear, did you hear him say that? That's why I call them contextual EVPs in, in all my books. Like, the EVPs are not the one phrase, one sentence stuff you see on TV. Ah, uh ah, -huh, what, yeah, no, you know. No, these are sentences of one giving another one orders, instructions, which it would, should make all of us think, is there a hierarchy going on within the unknown paranormal Portuguese meaning? You have one always telling the other ones what to do. You know, is there a hierarchy? Is there training? These are good questions. We should, is there a poltergeist training day? You know, when you start a new job, we all can experience that, right? You go on a new job. What's the first thing they tell you to do? You're doing everything your instructor tells you to do. Hey, go do that, go do that, go do that, go do that, go do that. You know, who's to say if on a on a paranormal level, a spirit world level, it's training day. Hey, go do that. Go through that. Ah, do that too hard. Ah, you know? Yeah. So I hope I answered that question. Yeah, you did. Thank you. And, and I'm really pleased that you brought up the third party with poltergeist because I myself, and I'm not bought by it, that it's just from the person, just from the, um, the human. Um, you know that I, I live in a haunted house. I've shared my um, evidence with you, Keith, uh, for some advice on what we've got going on. Yeah. We, like yourself and Tina, Martin and I, we're incredibly happy. We don't have any downs in our relationship. There's no negativity. He's a mental health worker, psychotherapist. I'm a sports therapist. So we've both got good jobs, both to live in a happy house. Don't have any concerns for money desperately, you know, there's no reason for us to have poltergeist activity in our house. Um, yeah. but, but like you, I believe as a third party, but also my belief in poltergeist activity is that when you get poltergeist activity, I'm not sure if a ghost brings in the poltergeist and has the beacon that says, Oi, in you come, or if it's the other way around, whether the poltergeist then is a beacon for other paranormal activity to join. So when I experience going to houses for cases and high-end cases, um, so you've got a lot of activity, I tend to call it multi-level so that you tend to have other things. And it's not just the one thing that tends to be creating the activity. That's yep. my thoughts on it. But we're all learning. Every day we're learning. 
Um, but like yourself, I don't believe that it's necessarily from the person. I think there's a second um, sentient being that I brings think, it. Uh, in 1990, one of my colleagues, Axel Johnston, proposed what we call Axel's Law, which is at that time the notion was that recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis, RSPK, that caused poltergeist was caused by family stress. And he argued that this was complete bollocks because although researchers found stress in every family they looked at, that's because every human family, every community, every individual put under a microscope has levels of stress. You know, it's just perfectly normal for us all to have you know, issues in our family lives that other people outsiders might be able to say that's stressful and it's a nonsense. So I also totally agree. And another thing is that the notion that societal stress causes poltergeists, I think we can probably disprove that now after the war in Ukraine and, you know, fears of nuclear annihilation recently before that, the COVID-19 pandemic, we've had more than enough social stress to have generated a million more poltergeists, yet we haven't seen it. So I'm follow I'm agreeing with Keith totally here. I don't, I don't think those are some things we should continue anymore. Sorry, that was just CJ busting in because I just wanted to mention Axel's law because I think it's absolutely true. Stress is not a factor in poltergeist cases. So you're not on your own there, Keith. You've got other people that think the same. So hopefully, maybe we can, um, you know, change other people's thought process on what could be happening Absolutely. in podcast activities. Yeah, yeah. brilliant. Um, the next question will go to Julian Knight. Um, Julian said, your amazing video link at the 2019 ASAP conference made a massive impression on me. You said in 2019, you heard a child cough have you any more thoughts on what that was or was it just a one-off event? So, uh, yeah, so the child cough was the um, first activity that me and Tina experienced on day one of the Bothell home. That was the day we went to sign the papers and get the keys to the home. It's interesting how it was a child cough, male child cough, and we heard it, um, but we disavowed it, you know, obvious, for obvious reasons. This was day one. Um, did we ever hear a child cough again? No. Child <laughs> voices were captured by paranormal teams in the home. Rhonda, going back to her, had three children of the age of the child cough. Um, my office, the infamous office where a majority of the activity took place, where you saw the wall writings, was the room that her son had who saw shadowy figures. He saw shadowy figures out of that room and elsewhere. Uh, later, or as we start living in the house more and days turn to weeks, weeks turns to months, uh, other voices would emerge. Now, in my first book, I didn't capture this, a paranormal team did, uh, and, but the audio is there. One of the researchers is outside the house on the patio at night, and she asked the question with her voice recorder running, are there any spirits out here? Are there any shadow people? And if so, how many? There's a pause, you wait, right? And then she can't hear with the naked ear, but upon review, you hear a male child voice say three. And I kid you not. Once again, audio video in the book, audio video in the YouTube channel. And it's in sync with her question when she asked how many, if so, how many shadow people are out here? And a child says three. What I found interesting, well, there's several things interesting about that response. But what I found the most interesting that coincides with a lot of the EVPs found in and around the Bothell house is a lot of the voices talk in third party. Okay. One of the voices we have or they captured said, the demons are over there. It's always one voice saying what the other ones are doing. They never put themselves, quote unquote, in the conversation. It's the, they're talking to third party. 
when Steve Mara asked, did y'all push Keith Linder downstairs? And the voice came back, you know, we pushed him downstairs. Not I, we did. So I always find it interesting a lot. And maybe that goes across other paranormal resources where y'all capture and see that yourselves and your other homes and whatnot. The EVP seems to always be a third person. But that, sh that should raise some eyebrows and shed some light of what we're dealing with. Of do they see themselves as a unit, as a uh, collective mind, you will? There's no individualism in the spirit world, uh, regardless of size, look, and appearance. They all work in unison. I believe the data from our house supports that, that they all work in unison and don't see themselves as individuals, but as a group, because they said we pushed them downstairs. And I thought that was kind of interesting. Unless it's a very British terminology of the royal we. So they're talking about themselves as in we, myself. Um, yeah, it's an interesting concept, isn't it? Um, yeah. Going back to the last one of Christian Lander's comments that he made at the very beginning, um, he said, the upside down man, the substance of bone black that's come up with the material to create these patterns, the incinerated buffalo substance, the symbol, it doesn't strike me as an upside down man, but instead a head of a buffalo with an X above it. Have you thought that yourself, Christian? I'm sorry, Ke um, Keith. No, but that's interesting. That that's I mean that's we know if you if you Google uh, Native American upside down man, you're going to get a symbol uh, that it looks like the ones in my wall. But even if it does look like an upside down buffalo, it just reinforces what I just shared with you about the bone black, about the history of the American buffalo and what was done uh, to the Mexican buffalo. But interesting enough, the upside down man, I mean, what, what does that mean to Native Americans and why do they draw it? Um, they don't draw the upside down man to imply death in the sense of, you know, when everybody dies, you draw the upside down man. No, no, no. The symbol when drawn is to imply that a man was murdered or died of disease. And the primarily disease or the primary disease was always smallpox. And this is not me saying, this is what the, the literature and the, and the, and the history uh, revealed, is the man died of smallpox. And so I worked myself backwards. I did some little reverse engineering intellectually and looked up the history of the Native Americans in and around Bothell. And lo and behold, there was a smallpox outbreak throughout the Pacific Northwest, throughout Bothell, where between 150 to 500,000 Native Americans lost their lives to the smallpox outbreak. And to add insult to injury, I didn't even know this then, the vaccine was purposely withheld from them at the time, but just giving to the settlers and purposely withheld from the Native Americans to where a majority of the Native Americans were put in mass graves in and around Bothell. Once again, this is not Keith saying this. This is the history of both Bothell and the Pacific Northwest saying this. So when you see an upside down man wall, uh, stick figure of a man drawn on my wall, and the makeup of it is bone black, it's not far fetched to put two and two together to say, yeah, there's some linkage there. There's some metaphor uh, being referenced here. Uh, the spirit themselves uh, are letting it be known because the, the area that we lived in, not to be not to be people know this, is newly developed land. The Bothell House was built as well as the houses around it in 2005. We moved to 2012. This is the new area, whereas it was forest. Before it was land to live on, it was forest and trees. And so it's new turned up soil, turned up earth, new people moving in. And um, we are not the only home that had strangeness or weirdness activity. 
Nobody had to the degree of extreme that we did, but neighbors did report when asked of strangeness and weirdness, as well as local law enforcement, which I put in my third book, uh, the reports from local law enforcement, because they know, they, they get calls, they respond. And that's another thing that paranormal organizations should try to do. When you're dealing with a residential haunting, talk to local law enforcement about the neighborhood. They will know, they will tell you about the neighborhood itself and what they respond to. And just ask them, hey, do you ever respond to anything weird? You know, and, and let them define what weird is without telling them what weird is. And say, hey, do you respond to weird stuff? And the ones in the Bothell home did. Said, yeah, and, and, I, and I put that in the book too. Thank you. Um, okay, the next question from Dave Sivia. Are there any details in the nightmares of historical horrors that could confirm them as real events? Uh, good question. No, it's the, the, the time periods and they're very abstract. I, 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 one, one nightmare or night terror threw me into um, the Vietnam War. I, and why, I do not know. I was in the middle of Saigon. I, I'm assuming it was Saigon, definitely Vietnam. But it was, uh, it was I, I was made a force to witness uh, the mass extermination, the mass killing death and rape of innocent uh, women and children. And it's just like they wanted me to be a fly on the wall. And then, then this one gets weird. And then they yanked me because I'm 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 yanked out of that scenario environment or movie reel or whatever. And it threw me all the way into 1930s Chicago. And I'm watching this police chase. And the and there's two police officers. This is 1930s Chicago. And I'm watching these two police chase chase this individual onto the top of a rooftop. They get, you know, stairway, stairway, rooftop. And they get up to the rooftop and they just shoot them in cold blood. You know, you know, put your hands up, pop, pop, pop. You know, it was, it was, it was, it was a white assailant. It was chasing after a white individual. And it was two white officers. But it, it, the period, the setting was 1930s Chicago. But I've been not able, I've been, I've not been able to make a rhyme or reason of that, except those two examples um, are what I remember, so yeah. Mm, thank you. <clears throat> um, we've gone back to the bone black again, as well as the graffiti that you had, Keith, with the bone black, was there any other graffiti that wasn't in bone black, like normal carbon pencil or ink or any other paints or anything? Uh, yellow oil, uh, never to be determined what it was. There was yellow oil um, that preceded the black oil. Um, the spirits did write on the office wall using sage ash, and how I know that is. One of the methods of trying to quiet our house down was to smudge and to sage. So I went out and bought a sage stick, and I was doing some smudging. But I will leave this, this, the, the sage stick on my bookshelf in the hallway. Well, me and Tina will come back and the house is in total disarray. Everything's upside down and crazy and destroyed. And I get it to my office and there's an upside down cross drawn on the wall. And then I look at it and, you know, you touch it, it falls off, it's very crumbly and it's ash. And I turn around and they're sitting next or laying next to my keyboard is the sage stick. Well, we left it on the bookshelf in the hallway. It's much shorter now. And it's, you know, it's half the size it was when I left. And you smell it, you, know, you can smell a sage stick and tell when it was recently lit or burnt or whatever. So yeah, um, yeah, they wrote, they used pencil, marker, another black oil um, that we, I never got tested. So I don't know what it was or is. Uh, so yeah, but mainly the yellow oil was found in the office in the living room. There's videos of it being found in the living room. Um, but we find the yellow oil in every room in the house. Uh, once we start looking for it, it's very translucent, very transparent. Um, it was Steve Mara and uh, Phillips who, who discovered that and Nick Kyle. Nick Kyle, a former president of the SSPR, uh, 
and they discovered the yellow oil. Uh, but it was everywhere, yeah. So do you think that the um, sage ash that was used on your wall was almost as if it was testing your faith? I mean, I know that you're a religious chap and your beliefs are very spiritual, um, but to use sage, obviously that's another kind of um, form of showing that your religious belief. Do you think that was another attack as well as the Bible and the cross and, and all things like this? Do you think it was challenging your belief? Yeah, one of them, and this is documented found in other Portuguese cases, is Portuguese, uh, you know, one of them that they will do, and ours did it almost perfectly, was, yeah, they're going to go after your belief system. Whatever you apply to them, they're going to challenge and, and take it and use it against you. It's very disheartening, and not so much mentally, definitely psychologically, to use a sage stick that I bought with my money to get rid of them and they take it and write upside down crossing. That's very, from a psychological, maybe it's a warfare, you know, that's very psychological. It's discerning, it's demoralizing, and it works. Also the burning mm -hmm. of the Bibles. I mean, who would burn a Bible, let alone three of them, or waking up and your Bible is on fire, not to mention it, when dis it disappeared for a year and a half. Where'd it go, you know? Mm -hmm. and. You know, the other two Bibles are burnt beyond recognition, mainly New Testament. So you're right, the, the psychological wears on you. Uh, one of the EVPs that, that I, I, I consider one of the uh, most underrated EVPs captured in the Bothell home was a male voice who said, I am a mirror, I am a mirror. And I always thought about that. Every time I hear that EVP, you know, me as a Star Wars geek, I go back to Empire Strikes Back where Luke Skywalker, there's a black cave, you know, and yeah, what's, what's that cave? And Yoda's like, it's strong with the dark side of the forest and you got to go in. And Luke's like, no, I don't. And he's like, oh yeah, you got to go in there. But it's a test. So he looks like, okay, if I'm going in there, I'm taking my weapons. And he's like, no, your weapons, you won't even need them. But Luke looks at him like, no, whatever. And Luke takes his weapon, you know, his pistol in there. And when he come, he, he goes in, he's confronted with, you know, the story of Darth Vader and all that stuff. Well, the what George Lucas was trying to apply with that whole scenario was you are what you sort of, you know, the expression you are what you eat, you are what you take with you. And me and Tina, by putting Bibles everywhere, crosses everywhere. Yeah, you're right. I am religious. I'm more spiritual than religious. These Bibles I had were never out in the open until we were advised or told to put them out in the open. Same with the cross, you know. And every time we put these items out in the open, the Portuguese would make mincemeat out of them because we're putting them out in the open. We're being told, oh, they don't like smudging. Well, nobody ever asked the Portuguese that, you know. We just <laughs> know they don't like smudging. Well, the Portuguese is letting you know, it has no effect on me. You know, there's a there's a leader of holy water that's still missing to this day that a priest gave us to use, and they took that. You know, so if a spirit takes holy water, you're like, oh my gosh! So I'm talking about psychologically. What? Who takes holy? Water, let alone steals it. You know, and they've not given that back yet. That that's somewhere out there in the ether world or whatever. You know, this holy water that's still missing. But psychologically, in my mind, in Tina's mind, it's like, oh my gosh! If they can take holy water and burn Bibles, you know, it's like the werewolf, you shoot a silver bullet at him and he chews it and spits it out at you. So yeah, it's very demoralizing. It's a bit like inviting a vampire into your home. It renders you absolutely useless, doesn't it? So- Yeah, yeah. it's like the law, like, you, like, you know, you shoot a you. vampire, the visible man, and just goes through, he's like, ha ha, you can shoot at me all day, man. I'm dead already, I'm dead. Yeah, the bullets have no effect on me, you know, you know, the cross, all that stuff. Y'all make that stuff to 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 help you suck, to help yourselves out of a situation. The poster guys yeah, are like, that don't really work on, on, on me. I mean, there's power in belief, right? But there's also power in disbelief, you know, and the and the poster guys is gonna do their part. So yeah, they took our Bibles and did all this stuff with them. And then you saw the negative effect that it had on the community outside. The ghost adventures of the world, the skeptics of the world, and like all that stuff. Thinking, man, you didn't write, no, nobody wrote that on there, but you did. 666, ah, you, man, whatever. Bible, yeah, yeah. You know, so yeah, it creates a 
a negative effect on both sides. It keeps the skeptics and believers at bay because they think, okay, that's too good to be true. What's going on at Keith's house? And that's what the Portuguese want, you know, the propaganda of that sense. Yeah, we want people outside the house to think you and Tina are making this up. So we're going to make this up seem so outlandish, so frequent that nobody will believe you. But on the inside, we're going to torment the crap out of you, whatever you give us. Give me what you got. Bible, King James, what do you got? What, what version do you got? Give us what you got, and, 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 and we'll make mints made out of it. And they did. They did. Going back to just something you said two seconds ago, um, the, the EVP that you captured of a male saying, I am a mirror. Yeah. In paranormal world, it's believed that mirrors can sometimes be a conduit for um, a doorway into the paranormal world. Do you think that's what it may have been saying, Keith? I'm the I'm the conduit for the doorway. Uh, no, I took it exactly what it, it meant when it said, I, I'm a mirror. Uh, because in, in studying other Portuguese uh, cases, new and old, I was able to pull up similarities uh, of the activity, you know, happening and the EVPs captured in conjunction with some of the other EVPs that we captured in the Bothell House. They pretty much admitted by saying over and over, not necessarily in those words, was, and they tried to get, try to give hints. Um, we are a, I'm talking about the spirits, are like a, think of us as a, a spiritual chameleon, you know, in a lizard who has the ability to change colors to match his or her envi environment for the purpose of blending in and for the purpose of survival, but for also making themselves invisible so they could prey on somebody, right? There are certain species out there who make themselves invisible. So they, whatever they want to devour or eat or whatever could come to them. And this was saying was, you know, this wasn't a Q and A EVP. This was just captured in the abstract where I am a mirror, you know? And when we start bringing Bibles and other religious paraphernalia into the home, yeah, well, this is what we got. The evidence, you know, there's an input and output. Bring a Bible in, the output is it's on fire, it's incinerated. Bring a cross in, normal cross, wooden cross, that's the input. The output of it is, oh, it's incinerated, it's burnt, it's upside down, it's missing. You put it over here on the wall, now it's over here. They're moving stuff in and around what we bring in. I always tell people, if my faith was... A telephone book. If I revere a telephone book, well, I'm, you know, I'm dating myself. And put a telephone book out there on my bookshelf and pray to it every night, or lit incense and candles around it every night, and kiss Tina good night. They would view that like, okay, what's up with this phone book? There's value. He's putting value into this phone book, and they would take the phone book, you know. But they saw me and Tina ceremonial and how we treated religious objects, so it's naturally for them to think. Ah, this is important to them. This is what they value. This is how they maneuver throughout the world. Faith. Oh, okay. He's putting this Bible up and opening up the Proverbs or Psalms. Okay, well, let's burn it. We burn it. He's more fear. He's, he's more scared of us. And we work. Oh, my God, you burn Psalm. Who, I mean, who burns? Who burns the Lord's Prayer? Who burns Proverbs? Who, who does that? You know, and, and, and it works in their favor because now we're scared. And that's what they want. It's interesting you say that they burned the things that you showed value to. Um, I've got a poltergeist case that I've been dealing with for two years for a, um, a gentleman. I can't give you any more details than that so far. Um, every time he does some minor works, even if it's painting a picture, anything that he puts time and value into, he'll come back within hours and there's big score marks across it or writing that's been etched into it. If it's like the woodwork that he's painted or a new table, it will be completely trashed. So, um, you know, he's just gotten so disheartened over the last two years of everything that he puts value into being trashed. So it's exactly. interesting that you say that, yeah. that yeah. it's another characteristic. Yeah, that's, I experienced that too. I think if you read my book, The Bothell, Hell House, I talk about the green coffee cup my mom gave me before I moved to Seattle. I, I, I let my friend drink up, drink from it at the house party. 
and I told her the story of how the coffee cup came into my possession. It was a gift to my mom, to me. And the next day that coffee cup went missing. It's still missing. It never returned. You, so you're right. There's a link between what we value and hold dear, but they use that as a demoralizing. So you know, as your friend, like he said, it, it, it's, it's a demoralizing, it's a beat down, it's psychological. It's they, These spirits are very, we always talk about the physical aspect of poetry, guys. I would love to pivot a little bit for everybody, whoever, to look at the psychological component because it's even more profound it separates you doesn't it you feel very lonely in that situation um there's not many people that's been in your position Keith that you can speak to and get a good answer back why it's happening so I get that it's isolating um Darren Hudson again said so much going on in the PNW of the USA in addition to the Bothell House it seems to be the epicenter of Bigfoot sightings large proportion of UFO UAP sightings large proportion of missing persons it's a paranormal hotspot for sure do you know about the other activities that's happening in the area yes you know pacific northwest sits on the outside of the ring of fire you know the ring of fire is the uh the you know the lines and the fault lines that go around the globe of the you know earthquake volcanic activity um and you're right, there are a large, there are a lot of UFO sightings, uh, Pacific Northwest, Bigfoot sightings. Uh, I have not seen any, but I, I've talked to people who have, and I, and I believe them. I will also say from a, you know, understand when you think about the ring of fire and where that is located, um, one thing we need to talk, also talk about one day is infra, infrasound, the invisible noise that could be happening uh, that's invisible to the naked ear. That could be summoning some of this activity that could be drawing the attention of, say, a UFO. Uh, who's to say the infrasound could be assisting, if you will, uh, UFO activity? Uh, I believe infrasound, there's a, there's a linkage between invisible sound and poltergeist activity. We talked a little bit about it with the exploding wine glass. We know sound uh, that is visible to the naked ear can explode material including glass um so yeah um but no yeah pacific northwest take your pick bigfoot poltergeist ufo uh there are ufo sightings in and around mount rainier uh in and around other extinct volcanoes um that's been a reason for that uh and and, and y'all would never know because y'all live far away there are a lot of poltergeist cases in the Pacific Northwest. I get mm -hmm. emails from both residential or some of the neighborhood groups I belong to, communities, and the Catholic Church. Every now and then the Catholic Church, I know the Catholic Church, it sends me, sends me because they need help with a family. Uh, the Native American reservations who are sort of America, unfortunately America's underclass, second-class citizens, it doesn't make the normal press, but the reservations themselves have a lot of Portuguese activity, a lot. And the Catholic Church is inundated. The reason, if you saw my book, uh, one of the priests who came to my house, one of his reasons for not coming as often as he could was he was always on the Indian reservations because they were experiencing Portuguese activity on a constant basis. So, yeah. It definitely sounds like the Native American spirits were um, angry, as Dave Sivia said. Um, it seems to be the link that makes most sense, doesn't it, really? Yeah, a lot of it doesn't make no sense, but then, while at the same time, it kind of does. Uh, some of the voices, when analyzed and listened to and reviewed, uh, these spirits view themselves... Uh, for lack of a better word, as avenging angels of the Native Americans that were illy, ill and improperly treated uh, back in the 1800s. Uh, these are not the ghosts of the deceased. I want to be clear about that, that are haunting the Bothell House or whatever. These are the spirits that are haunting the Bothell House on their behalf. Mm -hmm. 
and they I've, I've seen tv programs about where um the native american belief is that they put these spirits these vengeful spirits that are there as guardians yeah. to look after the land yeah and most cultures do most mm. cultures have have their own you know uh, and they will. And, and that's what I believe is the case going back to the third party entity portion of this in the sense of, yeah, you have these entities that are always present and they will interact more often than not, some places more often than not. Uh, and yeah, that's what you have. Yeah, thank you. Um, we're coming to the end of some of the questions at the moment, but we still have a few left. Um, so Nick Tyrrell says, apologies if everybody else knows this, but he, he doesn't. Um, is the current occupants having any activity? Uh, I have not spoken to the current occup occupiers of the home. All I know is the husband and wife. They're still there. Um, the uh, home sold uh, two months after I moved out. They were told about the activity in the home. They 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 did know. I don't know to the degree of how much they knew, but they knew. I have not spoken, and I and I tell people why well, I haven't spoken to. Them. I could be going by the house and you know spoke to. Them. I'm like, well, deal. I'll tell you why. Number one, they already know about the house. Number two is um, having lived in the house and knowing these spirits and knowing what could happen. Um, I believe. They're, they are experiencing activity. I believe it's called low level activity. If I go knocking on doors and being nosy saying, hey, are you seeing any flying furniture or moving glass or anything? Even if they weren't, I put in the thought in their head that they might or should. And if the home is inactive right now and they're happy and okay, that's what we want, right? We want mm. not to have activity. Um, it's not confirmation for me about my experience if they're experiencing anything because we know Portuguese activity doesn't work that way. Um, my house could be dormant. Uh, we know Rhonda was five years or six years before me, but there were families between us. And to my knowledge, they did not have activity. But there's always gonna be some low level line activity. Meaning, oh, this bulb or this sun is a bulb always goes out in this socket and this socket only, electrical issues, things you can easily dismiss. And that's fine. And that's fine. I don't want to go over there and put the idea or the seed subconsciously, because that's all these spirits need. If 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 every noise turns into a ghost noise, they will come back. And if they're happy and they made peace of the home, um, yeah, the spirits have gone dormant for how long, who knows? Mm -hmm. uh, we already know I'm still having activity. Rhonda was up until her committing suicide. Um, the neighborhood itself still does. I get reports from the police and, and, and friends who live elsewhere in the neighborhood. Uh, but I have not spoken to them. You know, if they invited me, I probably still wouldn't go. And there's nothing in that house that I would go for. Because if I go there, I know what's going to happen. I'm going to be want to go room to room and try to conjure up something. And I don't, I, I, don't, I don't even want to put myself in that situation, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, this is a great question, actually. Tony Percy says, Keith, have you used any of the speech to text apps to convert recorded EVP to searchable text? No, but that's a good idea. That's a good idea. And I'm glad you asked that question because I want everybody on this call to, you know, appreciate and understand we are living in marvelous times right now. Forget about current events on news and TV and COVID and all that. I'm talking about from a technical standpoint. The technology that we're living in now and about to emerge in, by that I mean AI, we're artificial intelligence. And yeah, there's scary elements to artificial intelligence. But like you were saying, voice to text, that's been around for a while. But mm. We now have devices that will respond to our voice commands in our homes that are constantly on. I, you know, it's gonna sound weird. Right? It's gonna sound weird coming from me of all people. I wish I had the Alexa or the Google app or whatever in the Bothell house that was constantly running or constantly runs now because if I say Alexa, what time it is, she's gonna wake up and tell me what time it is or Alexa, how do you make a chocolate chip cookie? 
she's going to go download the recipe instantly and tell me because she's always listening. Okay, she's on right now, but she's not making a sound. If I had these devices and other smart devices in the Botha home, can you imagine what the spirits would have done with that stuff and some of the fallout from an evidence point of view uh, we would have gotten or taken because, you know, the stuff technology, Google, Microsoft of the world, Apple and whatnot are pushing out now for the residential home. And the poultry guys, they're waiting. They, oh, they're chomping at the bit for that stuff. You know, if they can manipulate your voice recorder or your handheld device or, and stuff, I mean, who needs a ghost box when you got Alexa? You know? <laughs> I had to turn mine off four years ago because obviously with the, the activity started here about four years ago. And um, yeah, weird. So we can no longer have Alexa on. It was just saying... Oh, the the scheduled event that you've put in the diary is now in five minutes time, and it was like, well, what scheduled event? And it was things really silly little things like um, open the back door, and it was just like, well, why would I want to open the back door in five minutes? Uh, you know, and I had no friends around the house that could link in and play a trick. So um, Alexa's yeah, no longer. I, 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 yeah, all that stuff mixed into the, you know, you hear every news story every now and then and you hear about a house or some sort of smart device acting weird. And even the manufacturers are, don't know, you know, the, the latest thing with the AI last week or the week before, even they themselves mm. like, we don't know why I would do that. We, we, mm. we didn't program it to do that. That's not even in the code, you know, but it blows their minds. And I'm gonna, I tell people in the product, like, man, we're living in a marvelous time. Te te technology wise, we are. But we have to use that technology in a smart way. And I believe when we get, you know, irrefutable evidence by using, you know, like I, I was using the digital stethoscopes to make my argument about the digital heartbeats that I captured, because those devices were, were not made with a paranormal angle to them. You know, they're not those equipment per se, but they pick up weird stuff. And I take it back to the manufacturer and to the doctors and whatnot who use them. And they're like, it's not supposed to do that. I don't know what that is. What kind of heartbeat is that? Where did you, what doctor said, where did you get that heartbeat from? He's been a doctor for 45 years. Is it? And I'm like, oh, from my pillow. And you should see the look on his face when I tell him that. You know, his face turns gray because this is his profession. He knows what a heartbeat is like. He knows how to capture that, the methodology for capturing that. And, it's not noise. Oh, kids, it's just noise. It's thumping. It's it's da 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 da. It's pitter patter. It's picking up. No 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 no. Heartbeats talking about visually on a, I forgot what they call it, skeptograph or whatever, appear different. It's a signature, and a heart specialist would know that. That's his profession. He has to know that. He has to go into the the room with the patient and say, "This is your diagnosis. This is you know." valve per minute or valve per second and this valve open this one closed and this one the rhythmic and all that he can see that with his experience and naked eye that you and i could never could and translate it and say ask me where did you get that from oh i got that from my pillow in the conversation he don't backtrack nothing he said he just like because he can't go no further than that i can't have it come from the bottle house but he can't go no further than that except to say he stands by his conclusion, you know, and it's by definition unexplained because how was you able to get that from your pillow? You know, put up that scope to my heart and rule me out, obviously. I'm not even in the room. I'm not even in the building. These are remote tools. So there's no cross-contamination. And you could put my heartbeat, you know, as a baseline and see night and day so yeah we're we're in great times Tech yeah i think with all the developments of technology coming in you know hopefully very soon we'll have some answers but i'm going to be there right till the end asking questions i don't know about everybody else um moving on jackie tonks makes a comment as do i being an ex-police officer yes keith lots of police here in this country also have odd experiences including myself that we can't actually um explain so jackie i'll give you a message afterwards i'll have a little chat with you about something um yeah so i don't think it's confined just to the us it's definitely 
um, all over um, the civilized wow. societies where police, you know, have to respond to call outs. Absolutely. Yeah. And the fire department, the fire department that responded to my poster catching fire. They don't know all the other activity. Their job is just to respond to fire and put it out. And they are like dumbfounded. Hmm. That happened in your room. And they look at me and look at Tina and they know, okay, y'all didn't start this, you know? And they walk away scratching their heads like we're scratching our heads. And I read the other Portuguese cases of the past of both law enforcement fire department, especially the spontaneous fire ones cases, where the law enforcement and the fire department are equally dumbfounded and nobody knows. It's just one of those, wow. But this this is their profession. So I I, I like it when we obtain evidence from the Bothell House that third party coming into the environment could not explain. And yeah, they, they, they always leave scratching their heads, you know. Hmm. They're glad the fire is out. Like, okay, they didn't put it out, but we are glad. But they're a little bit upset at themselves, at themselves, of they can't explain what caused it. Fascinating, definitely. Um, there's a couple of questions left. Um, I don't even know how you would say that. Roy UKP, Roy Cup. Why do most investigators in America call their places a hell house? Uh, investigators, um, I don't know why they call it a hell house. Um, I don't know. Uh, I would need an example. Um, I know the Bothell hell house was uh, a hell house. Um, and to play on words, the word Bothell has the word hell in it. Bothell, B-O-T-H-E-L-L. Uh, all Portuguese cases, in my opinion, are hell houses. Uh, malevolent activity for the residents that are living there didn't sign up for this. And it is a hell house. You are you will be sleep deprived. You will be deprived of your sleep, of your sanity. Your belief system will be tested. The things that you value will be thrown again, thrown back at you. It will create friction. You know, and stress. People also say, well, Portuguese is stress is because the stress, and that's what creates the Portuguese. No, 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 no. But Portuguese activity can create stress in the home, and it will. Me and Tina became at odds with each other, um, but we weren't at odds with each other when we moved in. But yeah, I would say it, it is a hell house. Now, if you say it's Thursday in, in, in America, I believe it's America and the world for that matter, um, everybody likes to scream the word demon and, and every house is demon, demonic, or, or whatever. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's some truth to that. But that's that's the Hollywood aspect of it. Um, Hollywood likes to be infatuated with that. It gets people's attention, and everybody go back to thinking, oh, man, the movie Exorcist, and Amityville, and Enfield, and whatnot. Not to say that demons aren't real, because they are. And they do happen frequent, but we're letting another industry steer drive the conversation or dictate the conversation you know i like the term benevolent haunting i like the word haunting if you say well, there are demonic elements to the bothell house i would say a resounding yes you know we never talked about the insects the bees appearing we never talked about the foul stench smell uh those things uh we never talked about the scratches on tina uh, the hair pulling on Tina, me and her friends, all those things, the shadowy figures, loads of them, loads of them. Some of them I've drawn or can draw because I've seen it with my naked eye. Um, so yeah, but the word, yeah, hell house, I believe every house infested with poltergeist with an S at the end of it um, is a hell house. You know, there's the, you. the meme on, on Twitter. I love the meme I see of is, is somebody of, well, you can do this, Portuguese. You can throw my furniture around. You can do this and this and that. But can you please empty or load the dishwasher? You know, or do the ironing. <laughs> yeah. Or do the ironing yeah. or do the laundry. I mean, you're doing yeah. all this stuff. Um, until you do that, we're going to give you a bad name. You're a hell house. <laughs> If only, if only. 
And the last comment of the evening goes to Jackie Tonks. She said the First Nation people at the time of the Buffalo Massacre would have had very little respect for the Christian religion. I guess that she said that in relation to maybe the Bible's catching fire. She might have typed it around the same time. So would that be a thought process in in the belief that that's yeah. what could have happened? Yeah, and, I, and I'm glad she brought that up because uh, some people have told me this in the past as well. You're talking about this Native American bone black and, and, and stuff and the burnt Bibles. Um, and that and that is true. You have in, in America, um in the 1800s and before then, uh Native Americans were told or forced to either convert to Christianity or some die. Some were told to convert to Christianity and we're gonna withheld, withhold the smallpox vaccine, you know, that's very well documented. And if you hear both sides of the story, the, the settler side and the Native American side, uh, they both hold true. Native Americans were told to do this or face that or denied this because of that. Um, and then here comes Keith and Tina with all these Bibles and crosses. So yeah, there's some, there's, there's some, there's some, there's some, reason for a why a spirit a malevolent spirit would have take offense to uh bibles and whatnot because it's what they're it's what the, the native americans were dealing with but i think it goes deeper than that even and why i say that is because um the spirits in the buffalo home you know they got the upside down man you know they got the bone black and the black oil and the religious objects being burnt and, and destroyed. Uh, some of that they did because they wanted to keep the researchers away from us. Uh, one of the things Ghost Adventures says on their Demons in Seattle episode was, well, why would a, a Native American draw crosses or 666? It doesn't make sense. No, 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 no. You're assuming that all the wall writings in the wall, in the office, are being written and drawn by the same entity. Mm. No, 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 no. So we bring our own belief system and assume, assumption, oh, all this is being done by one entity. No, it's not being done by one entity. It's been done by several, okay? And we got the voices or the EVPs to back it up. What the spirit wants you, Mr. Zach, or whoever to do is not believe Keith and Tina because they don't want you here anyway. They don't want anybody here. So they're gonna make it sort of easy for you to disavow by putting 666 next to an upside down man. So you can make the conclusion, uh, Keith and Tina don't know what they're doing. They're, they're integrating Native American with Christianity, when truth be told, the two are not good bedfellows. The two are never, you know, no spirit would ever do that. That's, that makes no sense. Well, that's why they did it in the first place, because they want you to be dismissive upon review. A lot of people did. Keep in mind, multiple teams came to the Buffalo home. Multiple teams. Nope, there was no paranormal team that ever, ever considered to do an analysis, analysis of the oil. oil. That, to me, I still don't understand that, you know. Yeah, you can say it's marker or paint or whatever, but that's just you saying that, okay? Take some. Nobody ever asked me or Tina, hey, can we chisel some of this off? Can we cut some of this out and take it back to, we want to see what it's made out of. No team ever did that. So my request to any team listening to me now, if you ever get into a home where you got wall writings, and you think it's crayon or marker or whatever, I don't care how much it looks like it, take some and have it analyzed. Because seeing, we just can't take it on face value, oh, that's crayon. I don't care if the crayon is still on the site and laying next to the, the wall ready. Take it with you and have it analyzed. No team ever did, even Ghost Adventure, who has the resources to do that immediately, never even asked to do that. And they could have caught me and Tina dead in the rice had it been something to first. Ah, we had a tested key that, ha ha, you busted. It says right here, it's paint, comes from Home Depot, da 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 da, da. You know, we have the technology. The technology out there exists 
where you can trace material all the way back to the source, to the date and time it was manufactured. That is proven. The technology exists. Law enforcement does it every day. Universities do it every day. There's resources. It may take a while. It's expensive. But to get to the truth is rewarding when you find the truth. It was me who had the black wall analyzed and or it came back with bone black. You know, I, I never heard of bone black. So there's the answer to that question of, you know, the benefits of what was drawn on the walls uh, inside the office. Thank you. Um, as usual, Keith, an absolutely fascinating um, webinar by yourself. Love hearing you talk, love hearing the updates. Um, CJ, are you there? Do you want to ask the last question or finish off speaking to Keith before we end this evening? But until CJ comes back, Keith, thank you again from the bottom of our hearts for doing this for us. Um, we love your, your talks. Um, anytime you'd like to come back again, let us know. There's lots of thanks in the meeting chat. Um, when we upload that to YouTube, if you wanted a copy of the questions or anything, then just oh, yeah. give us a shout. We can give you the questions for you to have. But um, okay. does anybody have any last questions before we disappear off this evening? No, I don't think so. Like I say, there's absolutely lots of um, gratitude and thanks for your talk tonight, Keith. So again, on behalf of ASAP, um, thank you very, very much for coming and doing the talk for us tonight. Um, it's been a joy and we've loved having you. And as everybody I can see in the crowd, they're all giving you a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Thanks for having me here. And everyone want me to come back, just invite me. And like I said, you got my email address, send me those questions and I hope we can do this again soon. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. And that's good night from me, everybody. Um, Claire, are you here still? Do you know who's on next week? It's Neil Nixon, uh, ITN News versus Intergalactic Command. Um, not actually sure what that entails, but I'm sure it'll be fascinating as well. So see you all next week. Thank you. So that's a good night, everybody. Take care and have a lovely evening the rest of it. We'll see you next week. Bye. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.